Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey, everybody. Today's episode is with David Cantor. David is the creator of the Universe Tool we talked about in the episode with Seth. David has created this tool that is a visual representation of self and parts. Self sits at the middle and looks like a sun, and the structure looks like a solar system with the sun in the middle and three rings, and then he provides you with these bags of different balls that you can put on, um, and they're all different colors, and you can put them on um, different places on these rings closer or further away from the sun. Some of the balls also have feeling faces on them. The best thing to do is to go to his website because it's really cool. And um, unfortunately, you, you know, obviously you can't see him, but I just want to give you this description of I'm meeting with David over Zoom and he's in his backyard and um, and he has this huge like banner and he's got the um, model, which is pretty, I mean, it's, it can sit on a tabletop. It's actually perfectly sized, but it's, it's big. Um, and he just has all these things and he's got this shirt on and he's, he's just hilarious. And so the, this, this show is very fast paced. He talks fast. Him and I talk over each other a couple of times and it's a little bit long. It's, it's, almost an hour, if not a little bit over an hour. So um, I, I think it would be best if you go to his website, pause, pause the podcast, go to his website and check out the tool so you can have a visual, you can have a visual of it. His website is www.universe.net. Universe is y o u n i v e r s e dot net. Universe with y o u. Okay, so go do that, <laughs> and then come back. <laughs> Obviously, I want you to come back. Um, and so here, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an outline, just just so you kind of know what's coming. Um, and I'll be super quick. So he talks about this is a tool for self-compassion because it really does bring compassion to our parts. He, we talk about lots of different parts. We talk about scarcity. We talk about criticism, um, shame, and it's, it's hard to have, to not have compassion for those parts when you have them up there and you can see them all and you can see how they're all interacting and you can see the sun in the middle and it's a super fun way to play with it. My son, I've left it on my kitchen table and my son has been playing with it um, for the past couple of weeks. So that's been super fun. David has a book called The Big Bright Ball Answers the Call, A Love Story of Inner Proportions, and he reads it. So it starts off with a description of the universe tool, and then about 15 minutes in, he reads the book, which is really beautiful. And then we talk about parenting and the idea that I can be the self in the room with my child. We talk about this as therapists, that um, I can be the self in the room with my client's parts, but that idea that I can be the self in the room with my child. And later we talk about how kids can also be the self for our parts. And David shares a really traumatic experience he had as a teacher he he was a lawyer and then he was a teacher before he became a therapist. And so he talks about that about the 37-minute mark. He talks a little bit about his journey and it's definitely worth waiting to listen to that. And he weaves this through, this idea that living this way, living in self and with this motto, he says it a couple of times and I actually don't think it's really clear what he says, but what he says is, 
I want to bond with satisfaction at every moment. And he sa- he says that several times and that's his life motto. And he uses the model in order to do that. And then he talks about how that that motto has given him structure in his life. So it's given him boundaries and it's given him ways of balancing. So he talks about balancing his marriage and his practice and how he promotes this tool and this tool promotes IFS. And that, again, is weaved through. So so I really encourage you to listen to the whole thing. Oh, the other thing I, I thought was interesting about this tool is that it's a way of calling up self. And he talks about this right at the beginning, this idea that IFS, um, and you've probably heard trainers say this and Dick has said this, that it's a... Uh, it's a subtracting model. We subtract parts, subtract parts, subtract parts, or unblend, unblend from parts. And then once we do that, self is just there. And so there is this idea that I've heard a lot about kind of calling up self. And so it's not one or the other. Obviously, it's both. But he says that he calls it a, a constraint removing. So we remove the constraints of parts. And then when we remove those constraints, there's self. But this model also will help call up self. And I I thought that was pretty cool. So anyways, um, I said I was going to be short and this isn't short. (laughs) So sorry. Um, But I think this is, he's really fun. And you hear me kind of laughing at him because he's just a character. And I just really enjoy talking to him. And I hope you guys will enjoy this too. And okay, we've got some exciting things happening from now until the end of the new year and I can't wait to share all the cool stuff that's happening it's been great so I'll talk to you guys soon thanks enjoy this one well tell me where you are in the world and what you're seeing since you're sitting outside which looks lovely I'm, I'm in my backyard in a little courtyard here West Hartford Connecticut it's a it's a small yard but it's very sweet and pretty my wife's flowers are around I have all my universe self-compassion material surrounding me. I know this is audio, but I, I'd like you to see the, uh, the video of it. Of course, I'll send you all my stuff too, so you have it. It's, it's such a visual tool that can create that sense of, yes, I can be compassionate towards myself, always existing compassionate self. I love that. And that's why I like asking people what they see around them because I'm really visual. So I see something's behind you and that looks like what it is. And you're wearing yeah. a shirt. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing, I'm wearing the, I I'm love wearing the first shirt and the uh, the back of the shirt says, I love me. Do you love you? Oh, of course, I in IFS it. terms, it's self-compassion. It's all, do you love your universe of, of parts that, that are that are trying to help you out and, and might need your, your help to escape from roles or to be unburdened. But here's the uh, back of the shirt. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah. I love me. Do you love you? Universe feeling wheel, universe.net. I yeah. love that. What made you come up with this universe? I mean, it was completely, I should say, twofold, Com- both completely IFS inspired and completely, I would say, kind of pure Buddhism, Eastern philosophy inspired. Although I, I don't really see myself as an ist, a Buddhist or, um, per se, but so it, but it was really from the IFS training. This dates back to 2000. I think it was the second training Dick Schwartz did, the founder of IFS, right? And uh, he was the one, I think, solo. I think Mitchy Rose, maybe for one one of the uh, weekends, you know, trained us all, just wonderful. And the IFS idea of an already existing sort of happy, compassionate, courageous, calm self was something that I always knew it existed in me, even though I only at times felt that sort of, bliss, relaxed, yet energized state. And uh, so the, the theory of IFS spoke to me, a touch a place of truth in me immediately. Mm-hmm. And, and, and one of the handouts of IFS, in addition to being sort of totally immersed in the training, eventually you know, I did program assisting several times. I was an assistant trainer. And then, you know, self-led, launched myself to further spread the self-compassion and IFS out to whoever will see me and whoever I reach out to. <laughs> Just happy to spread the good word. There was a, uh, a piece of paper, a two-dimensional piece of paper that had, um, uh, Dick Schwartz, I think someone from um, the IFS community had, had come up with to give a um, description of uh, IFS, and it had self in the middle. This is a, you know, eight by 11 inch piece of paper, flat piece of paper, 
and they had manager, firefighter, exiles, an explanation of each, including the qualities of the self, on a flat piece of paper. And then I think it was probably the next morning, I woke up in sort of this bliss state between sleeping and waking. I was conscious yet completely relaxed. And this image, uh, a three-dimensional image of a big bright ball in the middle representing self, three rings, uh, each of which could be used to place parts, manager parts, firefighter parts, right? The two protector rings uh, on the inside, and then an exile ring on the outside. So it becomes like a Saturn self, like the three rings per se, but Saturn represents the, the compassion itself. Sending, you know, or the sun really, S-U-N, sending warmth, you know, warm power of healing, understanding, curiosity and and uh, healing to the to the planets or the parts of us that are carrying pain or forced into extreme world yeah i got a uh, prototype produced at a local he, it was an amazing place because they combined both the ability to construct these prototypes the two founders of this particular company they do to, you know they do toys children's toys adult toys uh, other prototypes uh, international they were they were both sort of artists and had an artist's uh, sensibility and aesthetic and very kind people and they immediately took to it and they they used it for their own families and for themselves the tool and they produced a prototype uh and since um of, of the actual tangible i call it a tangible tool right? a <laughs> tangible visual so and i love i can see it behind you and it's this sun like a, a yellow and it's like a smiley face and then there's three rings and then there's balls that are different colors along the, each ring so tell me correct. about those balls correct i'm just going to show you the the 3d of it and I'll, of course i'll send you my complete universe kit after yeah the okay. ball can be with it can be without a face okay and it can be with a face it's a sticker and of course you can have uh you can turn it they can turn it so that you don't, you, don't have, you don't have to see the sticker or you can see the sticker. You know, the hardest thing for people to, to realize and to access, I think those two are connected, realizing, recognizing, re-knowing, like, and um, experiencing is that we all have this self that's free of pain, free of self-doubt. So the visual with the always already existing, this big bright ball self, a tangible self, that's not removable, the rings, you know, this is externalization, right? As Seth had pointed out in your last podcast, so look, you know, look, I listened to the whole thing. It's really great listening to him. And the, the, the smaller balls are detachable, attachable. So they can be, they can change colors as you work with them, as, as, as you help the clients or whoever it is, achieve some self-energy, realize their self-energy, their self, and find out what the parts need to, uh, to heal or to uh, get out of a, a role they, they they were sort of forced into. Do you imagine that the rings closer to the sun are like the exiles and the ones farther away, like or firefighters, or do you have? Yeah, any I mean it's 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 very interesting. In my mind, the exile ring, and I purposely had the the outer ring have a greater distance uh, for the exile. I have the outer ring as the exile part, the parts that are carrying too much pain, or other parts protecting from overwhelming the system. And uh, however, as uh, Seth pointed out with his son using it, and this is, this is what I found is mostly true for adults as well. By the way, uh, adults take to this uh, a visual, self-compassion visual, the self-compassion idea, of course, self-energy uh, as much as the kids do. And they, they even need it more, right? The, yeah. uh, uh, we adults, uh, they'll put the strongest, the feeling the strongest, they'll put it really close. If, and there's a, there's a ring, uh, vertical horizontal ring, uh, they'll put it close to itself. It's just the stronger the feeling is. And that's the blending, of course. And then visually, I, I, I get permission to move the ball to say, well, this, this part of you, there's you and this part of you, and, we're, and I'm going to have you, the big bright ball self, which is at, not actually carrying the pain, help this part out. I love that. I love that. That's great. And then, and then you can do a whole, and I do, I mean, I see many people a week. I have a full-time private practice. In some way, I'm using it all, in every session, even if it's me noticing, reminding myself, calming my center, uh, coming to my center, and then uh, and I'll just I'll, I'll point to it to clients. So this this immersion, this visual immersion, the visual mantra, a message, a signaling that each of us has the self, and that these parts are in pain and they're looking for our help, and they can blend with us, and that we don't want to make them bad. Uh, it's sort of Kristen Neff's. Um, mindful self-compassion work, you know, also evidence-based like IFS, that, uh, you know, self-kindness, 
creates well-being, reduces anxiety uh, and depression, even can transform it. It's self-compassion, that is self-kindness versus as opposed to self-judgment, self-criticism, common humanity, we're all connected. Uh, you know, sometimes we're in power, sometimes we're in pain, we're not alone with it, or that we have parts that are in pain versus isolation. And um, of course, mindfulness versus over-identification, which is, you know, the externalization tool that does that. And then of course, with IFS, there's this self idea, the compassion itself, you know, that the compassionate mind, the courageous, calm mind, the curious mind, what Dick was so able to just, just artfully and with such, such um, wisdom, uh, transform into a tool and a protocol where people could actually apply it, therapists and people can use um, IFS for themselves, where the human response, you get a result in terms of our human response is, yes, I love myself. Yes, I don't want to be in pain. Oh, these are parts are in pain. Let me help them out. And it's another visual just reinforcing that. So I have two questions. One is, I think what I want to ask is, when you're sitting in clients, you're sitting in client with clients, and are you imagining, like we talk about as therapists or practitioners, that I need to be in self. And when I'm in self, then I can best help the person that I'm with, right? So if I have a manager that's thinking about what do I, you know, all the stuff that I need to do that day, then I'm gonna have a harder time being in self and helping the client be in self. So I guess I'm curious about what it, how do you use it for you on your own system when you're sitting with the client? Yeah, so this is uh, the threshold practice, right? The very first thing that we all need to do, and when we realize it, is exactly what we need to do is to is uh, self-compassion for the therapist on him or herself, with him or herself, with herself. And uh, you know, I recently did a, um, a several year um, stint teaching graduate counseling students. Um, really 90% of it was helping each of these graduate students as people and as in the therapist role uh, to exercise self-compassion with their own parts called counter-transference or the parts that get activated while working with clients. So I am, I am doing this sort of naturally now. It's almost like a second, uh, second nature. I am um, being kind to my parts, uh, absolutely noticing them and going to them. If they're coming up with the, with, uh, with the client, I am actually reinforces and enhances, I think, my effectiveness for the client because I'm doing it with myself and I'm all the motivated and all the more confident that, that clients, if they make this you know, U-turn, will find these great results too of, of a certain, uh, of the unblending and the relaxation that comes. And then, of course, they're available to the offer to do more of the inner work to find out what the, what the part really needs to heal or to, um, to remove itself from a, a role that's not helpful. Do you have any, like, um, I think sometimes when I'm sitting with a client and we're like, you know, trying to get to know a manager and sometimes I want to give them, give them more self or like help them feel more self more fully. And sometimes I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, with, when Dick Schwartz said, you know, essentially, and this is back in 2000. So I, I and he, he he has since I think even then, but uh, but he was emphasizing this uh, IFS as a constraint removal model. So it, the idea that if we remove the constraints, the parts that are blended, our self is always already there, and we simply need to remove the constraints. But I also love the combination of calling up self, calling up compassion. So one of the things I do in combination with the more classic. We, uh, you know, let's work with the part. What is the part? You know, what's the part of afraid would happen if it stepped back and relax? It can straight move a model. I read out loud often my big bright ball answers the call book, which I I think the listeners might like. I mean, we don't. It's a five minute read. So this is one of the ways I plant seeds and offer up that they can be. They have a compassion itself that they don't want to be in pain. Therefore, they must love themselves, or at least they want to be kinder to themselves even if they're acting badly or if, they, or if they're convinced that they're defective, that feels bad too. They don't want to have that pain of feeling like they're defective, so they must love themselves at some level. So I read this book out loud to adults as well. So I thought maybe I could read it out loud right now and then otherwise, you know, otherwise I, our listeners might feel like 
and hear me simply repeating myself. So I'm going to read this book. It's a nice rhyming Dr. Seussian book that I wrote. And my neighbor right next door from me right here is a great artist, Julie Phillips, a children's book writer. She did the illustrations, but I wrote the book and, and offered the illustrations up based on the universe tool visual and the IFS visual. Here we go. The big bright ball answers the call, a love story of inner proportions. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm in me, I'm in you. I'm a big bright ball with a golden hue. I come as I am with this to foretell. The story of me will ring a great bell. What's more I say, if you stay to the end, whatever ails you inside may very well mend. So listen carefully, listen true, as I share my story of me with you. Once upon a time, in a place inside of me, lived a multitude of colors, my internal family. I was their trusted leader, sure to wisely guide, and if ever one was troubled, I was right there by its side. But then, one day it happened, winds of burdens blew, and all my parts, each living hue, were blown from me or lost their view. Why, they were pinned and blocked and stuck in the goo, or forced into roles they weren't meant to do. They were up in arms or down with the flu, red with anger or feeling blue. Don't you remember what I can do? But silence reigned, they hadn't a clue. Why, I'm the center of the circle, I'm free of self-doubt. You don't have to suffer, I can always help out. I'm the core of the circumference, the wisdom in the middle. There must be some way to reach you, oh, what a riddle. So I tumbled and toiled, I rumbled and roiled, I rolled and cajoled, I stretched and kvetched. But there was no seed for my rye, not a soul to catch. Maybe, just maybe, I thought as I sat, the answer lies within, like Schrodinger's cat. So inside I went on a meditative bent, and I vowed to stay in till my time proved well spent. And then... A voice came through with words that rang true. It hinted and pointed and guided to. You're working too hard. Know your own pace. Between laziness and effort lies inspirations. And there I was, not beneath or above, but at my center. Let's call it love. And in that moment, just right, not laden, not light. Something shifted, something stirred, a miracle occurred. The forces inside could no longer hide. They popped and popped and popped outside. There was a red one, a blue one, a gray one, and a stark one, a pink one, a green one, a yellow one, and a dark one. And they popped and popped till the last one was done and popped one more time just for fun. Gasping was I, yet centered and still, my wish granted, my heart filled. I blinked and I winked, let the vision in, and gazed amazed at my long lost kin. I counted 10, 20, two dozen in total, a sight to behold, a family photo. Come hither, come thither, I said to my crew. I'm your captain, your father, your mother too. And the colors all sense that to me they mattered. The happy ones, the sad ones, the mad ones, the battered. To their Noah they flocked, their courage unlocked, to be seen, heard, held, and rocked. And when all was confided, the flood tide subsided, and they set themselves free, trusting their true selves to me. I saw harmony, I saw mirth, I saw faces filled with worth. I saw play, I saw woo, I saw no more boo-hoo. I saw tango, I saw tea, I saw the choice to simply be. I saw beauty, I saw glee, I saw authenticity. Well, now you've met the big bright ball. It's in me, it's in you, it's the center of us all. It's your turn now to answer the call, to go within and know your life, to shine it round to your colors or parts delight. Moral of the universe, why oh universe, where you are, there is no problem. In the, the same book itself, I have a how to use the universe with a rhyming, and of course it, and the website has all this. By the way, what I just read is also um, available on my website as well as everything else. That's here, there's a Spanish version of this book I just read. There's a guide to integrating the universe in therapy with case examples of myself, uh, Sabina Boots, who co-wrote it with me with case examples. Let's see. Oh, and the Feeling Faces tool, which, uh, you know, in addition to um, 24 colored balls, 12 different colors that people can place in the tools representing their inner world of subpersonalities, people that have carrying emotions and burdens and beliefs, 
in addition to those parts. I, there's 10, I have 10 um, feeling faces, there's 10 emotions on them from the, the basic five or six emotions with additional emotions like confusion. And uh, so, so clients have an open-ended chance to choose a color to represent what's really happening to them that they can then have a relationship with. It's all about connection, right, with ourselves. So again, this is just another uh, multi additional modal means, tangible, physical, visual for clients to be more in connection with themselves, of course, from a self-compassionate place with a visual mantra of compassion itself, the sun, S-U-N, being the warm power to the parts of them in pain. I love that. So I, yeah. one of the things that, I'm going to go back to the book, which was beautiful. Yes. And yeah. One of the things that self says is, I can always help out. Yes. I, I love know, that. I know. I love that because I think Me that too. my parts go, they go so fast and they're going so busy and they're so great. But man, when they feel so say, hey, I can help you. It's like, wow. I think my parts feel like if they don't go a thousand miles an hour, then it's not going to get done. And so. Right. That sense of urgency and, yes. and sort of, right, worry, pessimism. It's not, hopeless. it's not going to even work out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, lovely. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm touched by it myself when I read it, just to myself, you know. Because, and then of course, you know, in relationship with others, you know, my, you know, my wife is, you know, I can help out, I can support, you know. I, I love the idea of, you know, I'm each of us is our own primary emotional caretaker. You know, Dick Schwartz, Dick Schwartz is, you know, great, you know, beautiful idea, and uh, you know, his his book on couples, essentially uh, relationships. Uh, you are the one you've been waiting for. In addition to that, of course, as a secondary caretaker, you know, they also, they can also help out. Of course, they can also help themselves out. And of course, with kids, you know, Seth had a very touching version. I mean, he happened to be using the universe. His, his son was using the universe about something he was very upset about. And, and this is something the parent self, sometimes the child self is not, you know, because we're not empowered in the world as children, we need the parents to to help out for us. So it's both, you know, for kids, it's both, yes, they're on their own self. What can they do to help their own parts and themselves? Also action in the world, can they do? But also what can their parents do? That sometimes that a child uh, that society hasn't empowered yet, the yeah. parents, parents' self can help them out. Right. That's so interesting. I've never thought about that before because we talk about that as therapists, like being the self in the room for the client, right? So if the client's in a part and then I can be the self in the room, but that idea that I can be the self in the room for my child. So what often happens, yes. does that make sense? I was like, wow, yes. I don't think I've thought about that before. Yes. And the parents, so it helps the parents so much because, you know, you know, they're so often carrying this guilt, like, you know, that they're harming their child or they've done harm. And, you know, once they make that shift and their heart opens up and the, their mind, you know, you know, the understanding of the mind, to me, understanding myself and, so, and, or, and or someone else is an opening of the heart. Mm -hmm. Understanding sits right in the heart. They are one and the same. Understanding is compassion with other people's suffering, connecting to what's happening for someone. It, it's, it's a simultaneous occurrence. And they're just in this, this compassion for their child they only have to work on their guilt about past harms to their kids because they're, they're now transformed in this connection, compassion, caring for their child. And the child is completely understanding that the parents appreciate their worth and love them and will, will help out any way they can and want the child to be empowered in the same way to help themselves out or together, parent and child, to solve a problem, internal or external. Yeah, that's beautiful. Right. So if I'm, if, if I'm in self, if I'm, I have more self energy and then I can have a little more understanding for my son's, you know, tant tantrum or anxious, you know, anxiety, then that softens me. And then I think it softens him because when I'm in like a part that's like, get it together, stop acting like that, then that creates more parts in him. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, I'm sorry, you're in pain, you know, uh, instead of, um, instead of reacting to the, to the stress of another person's, in this case, their child's anxiety, the tantrum, I'm sorry, you're in pain, right? So, the, so I'm reminding myself to differentiate. It's not my pain, it's my child's. Therefore, I can be calm and loving. And then I can convey, well, I'm sorry, you're in pain. You know, and then what can I do? Probably after some pause, because the child's not gonna be um, uh, able to access his core principles or self while he's that hijacked, but, but you know, Right. The, the, of course, the other people, in this case, the child will pick up on the calmness and the caring energy will, of course, help the child's system start to relax. And together they can be compassionate 
problem solving internal or external yes exactly yeah yeah and then it has yeah. that self kind of looping right the more that's happening self. the more we're both settling down more we're both feeling self and then that's which right. is very different than i'm in a part you're in a part and we're just amping each other up as we're in parts yeah because because that energy at some level is recognized so the self energy say of the parent or of the other person uh at some level the other person is is is, is touching a place of truth of self energy truth that the other person has they oh i must have this too in me or they're, they're sensing they have it in them at some subconscious level because we all have we have self and self energy we all don't want to be in pain we want to relieve ourselves of suffering and as i would like to, as i say i want to bond with satisfaction in every moment oh i like that which could be very quiet time or it could mm. be more active but yeah whatever that happens to be my authentic truth of what would, of satisfaction i want to bond with that without doing harm to others I basically live by that. Structurally, it really helped. Like for my pra- full-time practice, you know, I I moved to a four-day week. You know, I've had no exceptions about working on weekends. Uh, in fact, clients who have been in crisis sometimes, have, uh, you know, I've they have access to me by phone, and um, it's never been a problem for clients whatsoever that I'm, you know, that I'm not going to actually see them in my office other than what I have. And it's great role modeling of self-care, self-compassion. And if I wasn't if I wasn't role modeling, I, I don't think I don't think you can fake that. I mean, so clients you know, have much more confidence and hope that oh, they can do this too, like he's doing it. Yeah, he yeah, seems yeah. happy about making those structural changes, how to you know uh, to uh, create balance in his life and to so we can bond with satisfaction more. Yeah. So, do you feel like that's something that you had to work on? Like, was there a manager, you know, a part that was like wanted to be accessible all the time and wanted to work a little bit more? And is that something that you had to negotiate with, like a part? I would you had to say yes. With? Only in the sense, although maybe it's kind of profound only in the sense that there were you know, exiles in me that felt self-worth injuries that said I had to sort of prove myself or be there for others or that unless I did these extra things, uh, people would leave me or not find me valuable or worthy. So I guess at the deepest level, the answer is yes. Although my first reaction to your question was, well, no, I, uh, it was more about uh, I just want to enjoy life and I was in pain otherwise. I have to change my schedule and structure around so that I'm treating myself lovingly in terms of how much I'm taking on. And right. so I can also enjoy other, other ways of being. I want to be in self all the time, but I like being in self playing tennis, kayaking, communing with wife and friends and my stepson. And yeah. so, you know, I want to have space for that too. Right. So I think that's, that's, that's where this part, this part work really helps out because it's like, okay, there's, there's, you know, self or even a part that sort of has this desire to have my life look this certain way, but then there's other parts that make decisions or say yes too much or run me. And then all of a sudden it's like, my life looks this way, but I don't want it to look that way. So I think people often find themselves that way, no matter what they do for work, that their life doesn't look the way they want it to look. Yeah, it's so fun talking to you, by the way. It just is just great. <laughs> Talk about bonding with satisfaction every moment. This is fantastic. So what I'm reminded of when you were talking, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm off the point or not, but what I was reminded of as you were talking about what you were saying is the saying, I don't know where it comes from. I don't think it's mine. If a yes to someone else is a no to you, well, you can say no to someone else you know, without making them bad, without an edge. If a yes to someone else is a no to you, you know, to your uh, mental physical, spiritual health or logistical convenience, (laughs) you know, you can say, you can say no to someone else without making them bad. Yeah. So as you're saying that, I think what comes up in me, I think I'm finally starting to learn that, but it's still a hard practice. I think what comes up for me, this is so interesting because I think there must be something about, what is that called? Brene Brown talks about it where you feel like you're not going to have it anymore. Like scarcity. Yes. That's the word. Yeah, scarcity. scarcity. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. Point. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's what it is for me. I think there's a part of me that worries about scarcity. So like if I don't eat all the food that's here right now, or even like I was, I volunteered at my son's school today and they had free food out and I'm like not hungry. I don't want to eat. And I was like, but it's free. Like, am I not going to get food later? Do I not have yeah. like a refrigerator full of food? Or like if my, if, you know, if random person says, Hey, do you want to get together? I have to say yes, because one day I'll never have any friends. <laughs> and so yeah, I so have this, to say yes to this it, random person. I, no, I have that. I have that part of me. I think I, I, I'm guessing everyone has that part of them. It certainly comes up often with clients 
this part. What I, what I, and for me, I'm thinking of, for instance, like I, I'll tend to eat at night late as a reward. I just enjoy food. I eat well. I have like healthy, enjoyable, tasty food, but I can, I can eat more than I need, you know, I'm more less, especially at night. So, you know, some emotional eating part to some extent, it's not really relieving stress because my life's pretty, you know, contented right now. So I'll say to that part of my mind, and of course this is based on evolutionary biology and uh, it's like, it's not about survival, right? So I'm, trained, I'm, trained, I'm talking to that survival mind part of my mind. You know, I think that the neuroreceptor that lies, I think just below the amygdala, that gets raised to the surface, the fight or flight. And I'll say to myself, that part of me, this is not about survival. And that's sometimes, I would say about 30 to 40%, I, I, I cannot lie, not more than that, but 30 to 40% of the time, I actually won't take the extra food that I don't need it at night. It'll work just that. This is not about survival to the part. And then if not, I'm still compassionate with myself if I, if I eat uh, more than I need to and I don't need. And I'll continue to work with that part that doesn't realize that overnight digestion is interrupted if I'm eating late. <laughs> so I'll talk to that part. Yeah. About, its, about its survival scarcity fears. Yes, and of okay. Course it can go, and that can, of course, go to and what's familiar about that. Is there a younger, more vulnerable part of me that had that? And you know, what is the scarcity? Is it love? Is it attention? Is it being able to uh, be in a team sport as opposed to be rejected and not make the team? Is it uh, time with my mother because she was working hard with my sister? What is the scarcity fear of that younger part? And then boom, you're right in there. Yes, beautiful. I love that. I self-disclose this stuff with clients, these kinds of examples, and it really helps expedite them open them to the kind of internal family systems work. Yes. And, uh, you know, using the tool often is, is a way to open it up. Also, even to deepen it. Either way, it opens clients up to the work when I self disclose this is the connection of this part that I discovered just about uh, eating at night. Like, oh, this is a young me that, you know, was afraid that. Yeah. And I, th- I think because they don't know, clients want to, pl- I think, I, I think clients want to please us. And if they don't know the model, when I start talking, sometimes it is helpful to, to self-disclose and just mm-hmm. sort of explain it that way, right? Mm-hmm. I found myself overeating at night and then I met with this part and da, 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 da. And so mm-hmm. then they sort of see the whole the way the whole si- how that works, yes, the whole sort of system. Come, That's right. Yeah, from like find a part to yes. witnessing the yes. exile, and then you know you can say that and like what you just did in a you know two minutes, and then the client goes, oh, I get it, and it starts sort of even if it's an intellectual. I, I don't. I think that sometimes there's a part of me that's like you're being too intellectual, and then there's another part of me that's like, no, I think it helps give them a little bit of a roadmap to sort of where we're going. The what I, what and, I mean. And absolutely, and I and I gotta say, I mean. One of the impetuses, even though for the universe, the, the feeling wheel, the visual, you know, uh, the self-compassion tool, this IFS self-compassion tool, was so it makes it so much easier to convey what I'm hearing clients describe of the inner world, the whole, the whole map, the whole, the whole inner landscape. And you put it up there and without fail, all ages, kids, teens, adults, they see all the parts and, and often... Uh, we get to a place how they're all connected and influencing each other in one place on this universe, this visual universe tool. And they are amazed. They're both relieved as anxiety is, is basically eliminated and they get clarity as in confidence. I love that. I love the Latin for confidence. C O N con con with fide from fidelity, truth with truth, with their own truth, without judging it. Like, oh, I'm seeing the whole thing in one place right on this universe, the inner universe. They can also see it. So it's not just me putting out words. They can see it together. I can get quieter. They can get quieter. And then we work with one part or sometimes polarities. Polarities are very complex often for people to do. And and with uh, they can see it there. I can show them on opposite ends. And they actually have positive intentions, just different strategies to help the self or protect self. And then they're they're working with these, what they thought were unsolvable inner conflicts or polarities from a different place, from an observing self wise self, both of us together, looking at the polarized parts and helping them out. All right, so I'm going to back up to the scarcity and you saying oh, yes, that's, yes. That's, that's not about survival, because what I thought about is that's instant self-compassion. That's instant compassion, because so say if I am in, you know, want to eat the food at the, the thing this morning, mm-hmm. and, then I'm, and then I get angry, then I'm critical. Why do you, why do you want to eat the food? Like, even mm-hmm. if I didn't eat the food, just wanting to eat the free food, uh-huh. I'm mad at my, you know, why do you want to eat the free food? What's wrong with you? I'm going to start calling myself names. Mm-hmm. But the then, 
Totally. Right. 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 And I'm in, and, and she can be nasty. Mm. So, but if, if I was to notice that that came up, right, that, oh, there's free food. I have to, I have to get the free food. And then I say to that part, Hey, it's not about survival. That implies that I know that that part's function had a, has a function for me. And That's if right. I know that a part has a function for me, it automatically gives me compassion because I'm like, Oh, it has a function. Okay. I- I love that. That's right. The absolute pure positive intention for my well-being, my part has for my well-being, the survival, the ultimate, right? Yes. We can't advance and thrive until we survive first, right? Even Don't that self-critical, stuff. even that self-critical that can be so nasty. She's got a yeah, function I mean, too. Yeah. When I work with my, uh, when the self-critical part comes up, which it really doesn't so much any, uh, anymore around... Uh, most things, and it doesn't really come up so much anymore around the um, eating at night. However, when it does come up, what's its positive intention? It says seems to be saying the same thing each time I ask it. It seems like it's saying, "Well, I want you to bond with satisfaction every moment. And if you eat late, you're gonna if you eat late, you're gonna you're gonna wake up physically. You're gonna feel kind of late in and not as feeling as good physically. And you can't have your full liveness and joy for life. And I don't want you to suffer. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. I said. So, you know, I said, well, you don't have to be hard on me. I get it. I'm working on it. I'm human. And uh, it helps me sleep a little bit, having some food at night. And so, so I'm sort of in discussion with that one a little bit. I love that. And you're also like, but this brownie tastes really good. <laughs> exactly. It's a reward. It's enjoyment. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, I, but, and, and since, I, since I'm generally loving towards myself, including my physical well-being, I'm reminding the part about that. It can relax and let me take the lead and not be so harsh on me if I overeat and, and uh, you know, it's temporarily somewhat harmful to my body. It knows that I'm on the same page. I'm trying to be good to my body too and try to stay in balance. Yeah, so I'm guessing too that one of the benefits of having this external visual with the sun and all the planets is that then I can see, okay, if this planet over here you know this pink one over here that's like stop eating and then I have this one over here that says but hey that brownie is really good I can really get that like okay well there's this voice here and there's this voice here and the sun's still there and there's others it's sort of like I can really have a whole look at the whole you know I literally am looking at the whole system so that it's like oh I can so I don't get I don't get totally blended or hijacked by one part and then get lost exactly and I mean it's to me you know this one part is saying um you know, uh, long-term gain or temporary pain don't, if by not eating the food and having that reward, long, long-term gain, you'll wake up feeling better. And the other one says, no, short-term satisfaction. Uh, so you have a little pain, but you get the short-term satisfaction. They both have positive intentions. They both want me to have a, a, a satisfaction, enjoyment. Yeah. Or which could, you know, in some ways want me to feel good. And if it's, uh, not, about, and if it's not about survival and they realize it's not about survival, they can relax and then I can make the choice which then I'm more able to not have the extra food that my body doesn't need. So let me ask you kind of like a weird question that you don't have to answer. Sure. <laughs> so you, how did you end up hooking up with Dick in 2000? I don't know. I want to, I no, want to hear, so give I, me the inside yeah, scoop. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the true story. So I was, I, I, this is my third career. So I'm a lawyer, did that for three years, dreaded going to work every day, you know, with, it's, it's intellectually stimulating. I think it's, it's wonderful civics. You know? And so it was really a wonderful uh, training, uh, law school. Practicing, though, you know, you have very competitive, can be dog eat dog. And I was a trial attorney. So if I didn't win for my client, you know, I'm letting down my client. Innocence and guilt is built into every choice. But I had to do, uh, you know, not Trumpian, uh, the ends justify the means, but uh, legal, uh, legal lying. And the other attorneys are doing legal lying. And it was awful for my soul. Mm. So, um, so I got out, though. The pain led me, thank goodness for the pain. I listened to the pain. And it said, and I had panic attacks. And I woke up one day. I said to my panic, oh, this will lead me to Dick Schwartz. And I said, because it led me to become, to, to become a teacher. The experience with my panic attacks, I, actually, this is prior to IFS. This is I was 20, 26 years old. I think it was my third year of practicing law, which had turned out to be my last year. I had a panic attack. I woke up. It was the third one in a row. I said to my panic, I didn't know anything about part psychology at all. I said to my panic, I was so desperate. I'll do anything. It was like the meatloaf song. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. But I'll probably do even that. Like I said to my panic attack, what do you need from me so you'll never give me a panic attack again? And it said one word. Can you guess what it was? Quit. Quit. 
Exactly. Quit my law job. I said, I promise you I'll do it. I, I need it like six months to a year uh, just because <laughs> I want to get my severance, whatever. And, um, and I don't know what I'll do next. And I'll, you know, let's talk about survival. I need to make a living uh, and I need something else first. And it hurt me. I mean, I was, I was so sincere. The pain was so great from panic. It, the panic went away. I never had one again. So I'm imagining if someone goes to law school, that's like a big deal. So you go to law school, you pass the bar, you're a trial lawyer. I mean, you're like John Grisham, right? You're like this really yeah. big deal. Yeah. So yeah. were there parts of you that were like, no way we can't quit this? Yeah. I mean, there is, you know, I, I think men suffer from the shame more than women and, you know, in, in the more general sense, you know, where their egos are need to, I'm not saying that negatively. I'm saying that, you know, I think for men, if we're not making our own way, because, you know, shame is just so difficult to experience that we'll do anything, including, you know, stay in careers that we hate, just so we don't have to feel the shame or the worry that we won't be able to make it. So there was, there was, that was there, but the, the panic attacks were so painful, so scary, actually. Mm. Scary in the sense that, uh, not that I was, um, good, was suicidal or anything, but I thought, like, I could, like, in some fugue state of panic, accidentally go out a window or something. Wow. The panic was, it was a, but I knew it was a panic attack. Yes, there was some of that. You know, I really went to law school for my father. It wasn't for me. Yeah, so this all led me to this idea of being self-led. And when, when I came across it, my first year of grad school is when I came across in the first course there, the professor who taught it, I think he had just discovered it himself. Uh, this is in 1999, perhaps, 1998, probably, maybe 1997, 1998, uh, IFS in the textbook, and I immediately understood the theory and how it could be applied in the human response. I had these prior experiences of pain and the panic attack and, and wanting to move away from pain. I totally understood these parts. At five years old, I understood the parts because uh, I had a kindergarten t a teacher shame me, and I carried shame. I know it was her fault that she did the shaming, yet I couldn't get rid of my shame. And I said, this is amazing. I have these parts getting things. So I knew at five years old about the multiplicity of the mind without having that phrase or vocabulary. Wow. wow. So I switched out of, and when I, so I switched out of law. Uh, so I, I was true to that uh, panic part and knew I was going to be true to it and to myself, self-compassion. And I got a teaching degree and I taught high school for five years. Wow. And there I saw the parts of the kids, you know, lash out against each other, against themselves, against me. And, uh, you know, I tried to be a, really a, a therapist, a healer. But my obligation was also to, well, was to actually teach them the curriculum. So there was a real split in my, in my needs there. And so pre-Columbine, a kid th threatened me that I knew he was going to take me out and the rest of us too. And my conversation with him, I met his parents and they were in a worse state than him, more hostile state than him. And um, I, 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 said, I said, you know, it's up to you. It's voluntary. There's no punishment. What he did was pretty extreme, and he was—he was gonna, yeah, he was gonna shoot me the next day in my class. So, um, and he came that day after school, and I asked. We just spoke, and I essentially, you know, to use the vernacular, spilled my guts to him about myself, all my vulnerabilities from a childhood on, even as a teacher, all my self-confidence injuries, everything. And uh, he came another the next three nights, just 20 minutes before the late bus, and at the end of the um, that week, he. I finally paused. I know I'm, and he said to me, "This is a dead end town. Life sucks, and then you die. You met my mother. My father's a thousand times worse. Don't tell me there's any hope for happiness in my life." And then the conversation opened up. We had this great conversation with each other. Um, that look in his eye when he was threatening to kill me and the rest of our class was completely gone. Just friendliness, connection between high. That, that evening, it's a Friday, I said to my principal, who I was friends with, I said, Bill, it's my last year of teaching. I'm going to become a family therapist. He says, why? He says, no, don't I says, why? I said, I just had this experience with him, and it, it's changed my life. And he was, you know, the, the student was friendly the rest of the year. His grades actually improved. Most importantly, though, yeah, it was just a beautiful thing. It's and amazing. so I thank him, in a way, for, for coming to my room. Uh, you know, I just sort of, essentially was sort of pleading with him or, in a, in a totally sincere way, you know, if you know me, you won't want to kill me. And so, and so I was so grateful to Dick to have a, uh, to organize something in a way 
it's practical where you can apply it where it's accessible to people and we can mm. convey to people where they actually can have a human response to it, to have self-compassion and be able to talk for what's really happening for them mm. and open to kindness towards themselves and others helping them. The practicality of Dick's uh, model, of course, in addition to the concept, I mean, I, I knew immediately this is just fantastic. I can't believe it exists because I, Gestalt was, was very good training. I'm, I'm training Gestalt and all that. But I said, but it's hit or miss with Gestalt. With, with IFS, you can actually go there to every part that's in need with the self energy. Everything's accessible for healing. How are you feeling after sharing that story? Well, I feel um, it's been some years. I feel energized and also relatively calm, but I, I feel more in touch with my heart as well as I tell mm. the story. It's the, dis the distance I feel from it is not because I was trying to escape from the trauma of the threat, but rather the, um, the transformation happened pretty early on, you know, mm. because of, his willingness, the student's willingness, and he showed up. And he mm. let me, he let me show myself mm. to him all my vulnerabilities. I mean, how, I mean, how intimate is that? How grateful? I mean, he was like, mm. he was like the loving parent or brother or sister. Wow. Allowing me to show my pain to him. Right. Because I knew he was in pain. And, uh, and then he showed me his pain. And it was just, what a gift. Like, wow, right. The opposite of rejection. Like it's, he's, he's loving right. me with, with, with telling me about himself. Right, and, and he's the kid and you're the adult. And right. often we don't think that's supposed no. to happen, right? And so it was, like, it's mm. that equal. It's like we are equals. It's, it's, I was living because it's true. We're all equals, right? Yeah. Different yeah. in all these ways and equal. And he knew, and of course all my students knew teaching them yeah. that I saw every person, I don't, I don't care what the age is, we're, mm. we're equals. Mm. Uh, you know, there always yeah. be greater or lesser talents. And, but that's, that's yeah. yeah, and so that, um, yeah, there was no one up, one down there at all. Hmm. It was that mutuality, yeah. And if we think about self and parts, that it's like, my son, he's eight, he has self, he already has parts, I have self and parts, why am I better or stronger or whatever if, you know, he can be in self and I can be in a part, and that certainly that's has happened. Right, right, exactly. It can be, it can be inverted, that's right, yeah. And we, we, yeah, we all have this self and self energy. It's just a truth. It's an, you know, always already existing truth. Yeah. Well, I think that's what you're saying about the model is the model really helps us be, helps us see each other and ourselves as the same. Yes, absolutely. It was attributed to the, um, the Native American chief the, uh, about Mother Earth. He said, um, we are a living part of this earth. Each of us are a living part of this earth, of this mother earth. If we do any harm to her, we do harm to ourselves. And so I say, I, I say the same thing to myself and to anyone, <laughs> clients, anyone who's willing to hear the phrase. We are also, we're, you know, these parts of us, all our people inside of us, yeah. all our parts, all, you know, they're a living part of us. If we do any harm to them, if we do any harm to our parts, we do harm to our whole selves. Are you, do you still do a trainings? I was uh, program assisting several times, different places, and then uh, Hartford, I think, and uh, New Britain, and uh, then Boston. And then I assistant trained once. And what's the beauty of um, IFS, you know, I talk to Dick about it when I see him uh, occasionally if I go to uh, conferences, is um, it's just self-led. I just, you know, I'm launching myself, IFS, and other, you know, aspects of me and my philosophies out into the world. So. Um, uh, you know, for instance, I, I went to the, uh, we went to the Big E, it's a huge public fair, five state fair, and I have, you know, what you're seeing behind me, the, the most powerful selfie you ever own. The, the people that came, lay people, <laughs> oh nothing, they glom to this idea of a kind self that all parts are welcome, they can express themselves with a compassionate self at the center, kids showing their parents is how I'm feeling, adults coming to me wanting to put their depression up there. Oh, and they this, this, they great. were just so grateful. Yeah, I mean, and uh, many many people bought. You know, and it wasn't. You know, it's not that cheap. You know, for the public, uh, bought the universe and the books and all that. And uh, we did that for two years at the Big E. I mean, they say I a million that. people go through that fair over seven. It was seventeen days straight. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so yeah, so I'm I'm out there uh, in the world extending the self compassion and IFS all sorts of places. It was a choice. I think if I um, 
wait, we only have so much energy and time and space to, um, to organize. And so um, part of me was, you know, I, I came into this, this, you know, it's my second marriage. It's just a happy, good marriage. So I wanted more time here with the family and with my own sort of pursuits of self-compassion conveyance to the world in my own way. Plus I have this full-time private practice. So um, yeah, so, but Dick was great. Dick in, um, invited me to the plenary, I don't know if it was 2005, with the IFS tool and I read out loud like I just did now to you know all 400 people that were there at the plenary and he spoke great 20 minutes and uh, I had pictures of the universe and how I use it with clients and there's a standing ovation and I sold out I think I had maybe at the time I only had a hundred uh, tools that was I've just got a mass manufacturer I had a hundred I think I brought 50 of them they sold out in five minutes and so I've just been getting getting the word out you know it's great obviously with my clients but also right. to a wider audience to the extent that it's not um, unbalancing my life. I think that's the thing that I, that feel that I feel pretty strongly about is that we need to teach things that we teach in the therapy room outside. Because yes. There is, there must be, I'm sure there's a statistic, a statistic out there that talks about, you know, with the percentage of people that actually go to therapy. So we know, you know, we know that it's probably a really small percentage of people actually go to therapy, but everyone needs it. So then we need to figure out how to take what we know, like what we know about IFS, what we know about self and parts, and we need to figure out a way to get it out there. And so yes. I think that's one of the things that you're saying is like, if you can show up at this fair and you know, I live in New England and so we, mm -hmm. it's fair season and we love yep. going to fairs and wouldn't it be amazing is, is we're going around fairs, you know, how many people that go to a fair go to therapy? I don't know. But like, so you're hitting a different Mostly audience. Not. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, so that's these, what I'm, yeah. God, I'm getting so all that's like, what I'm doing. I, and there's different, there's different fairs. I mean, to the extent I have time and energy and, you know, and other times my wife and I were up in Maine, you know, some, but uh, kayaking or something, but the, um, so yeah, there's all sorts of fairs. There's mindfulness fairs, there's arts fairs that, that I occasionally, and probably more so, will, um, it's always available. But again, <laughs> if I'm overly striving, I don't want to be in that mode because it's harmful to my system. Exactly. But absolutely, I did want to say that I just, um, from the Big E and for other ways that I get out there, I've, I talk to, I talked to the group with, uh, there's an autism um, group I spoke to, and, and also and schools, being a high school teacher, you know, I understand the, school systems and what's like you know from student end parent end teacher end administrators so i have someone who uh just got a grant and she's gonna get the um that saw me at the big e and just contacted me and she I think she's a department head of a, a system in springfield math and it looks like she's her, she's going to use her grant to purchase some universes for her counselors her school amazing counselors. amazing so that's just one example of that and then you know hopefully she'll be interested in in service so I can really, not only do I want them to have it, I want them to use it in yeah. a way that works for them, but I also, it's an opportunity to give them in a way that, that they might use it and be motivated uh, and not intimidated. Uh, I want to convey to some internal family system ideas to them and how they can use it. So yeah. the, the in-services often flow from that, which is really a joy for me because that's the connection where they can say, ah, this is how I could use it with my people, my students, myself, my family, Great. my school. Yeah. So if anyone's listening, if, if you're a teacher or if you're a part yes. of a school or an organization and you want to get in touch with David, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, so I mean, my website has all my information, so the, which is universe.net, spelled Y-O-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-A, U. And my phone number is 860, which to me is the best. I mean, I, I love the You're phone. really going to give your phone number? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's the, this is the same phone number I use for clients and business because we want to all be accessible, right? It's uh, all self-editing. Yeah. What the heck, right? Okay. All right. So I give your phone words. number. Go 860, ahead. 860-796-7600. 860-796-7600 and uh, leave a message. I'll get back to you. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that goes back to this idea of you living a life that you want to live. Like you've, yes, you're like, that's it. right. A you're not life. Yes. Right. Right. So you, you have something, you have a private practice, you have a great marriage and you know, you go kayaking in Maine, but you, 
and you put this out there, but you have found a way to work with your parts and work with your system so that it's just enough. It feels like you're, you know, you're doing it, yes. but it's not. And, it, and my guess is you've had to work with your system in order to figure that out. Absolutely true. Exactly. I feel so seen and understood by you. You're, Aww, you're serious. Thank you. That's exactly. It feels so good. Thank you. Yeah. So one more question. If you weren't doing all this stuff that you're doing, what would you do? If I wasn't doing what I was doing, well, I think the answer is uh, I'm bonding with satisfaction with whatever that might be. Possibly I might be doing sort of uh, some kayak touring, you know. My prices would be very reasonable because I feel like it's too much for people to put out for the, the day. Because since I have my own kayaks, and I, and that I, you know, I, it's so economical. So I want people to have access to their own enjoyment where I'm not, I'm honoring my relationship with myself. I've been doing anything and everything where I'm both honoring my relationship with myself as well as honoring the relationship with the other without surrendering, anyone having to surrender their course for self. Right. And I feel like, as you say that, I feel like sometimes I have to tip. Like it's either like I have to honor you or honor me. I can't do both. And it's like, why? That's not true. That's a both end. That's a beautiful both end. Yeah. Yeah. We have kayaks. So we have kayaks and I have a paddleboard. And so what we've been doing is we do a kayak paddleboard sort of thing. But I know what you mean, though, because we've done um, the Saco up in Maine. And it's like, well, I have my own stuff. I don't want to pay you for yours. But I also I need the ride. Like I need the <laughs> I need the ride uh, yes. to put in and then take out and then I get overwhelmed. Well, like, how am I going to do that? Yeah. And yeah, what, what we kind of lucked out, although I, I got to give my wife all the credit and well, my, I give myself 2% credit. Uh, we, we used to rent places up at Maine for a week. You know, you get this beautiful, you could practically a mansion for a thousand bucks a week then, whatever, you know, just an amazing place. You go. Uh, and at one point, you know, we're coming home and my wife says, you maybe we should buy something. I said, I don't have any money to buy something. And she goes, well, isn't she that stock that you made some, had some profits in there? I'm like, yeah, but I'd have to sell it. It's going to keep it. So like a week, so I went on the internet and we found this, on uh, this new build unfinished i i mean one third the price of anything else in that neighborhood because unfinished i knew this area because i've been visiting maine for all the time and i said and it's 300 steps down is a public little boat launch i think two weeks later we, i sold that stock we sold on the house we sold what? the uh, post on the house so i have these so i can just wheel my kayaks down 300 Aww. steps and i can leave them there for the summer back so i have this i don't have to even put them on my car so and, and that's in mid-coast maine where there's i you know there's there's just islands there's a 360 way you can go there's all sorts of variety it never gets the landscape never gets old open ocean ocean rivers calm topsy-turvy the whole thing stop to get a lobster so but that's all because structurally and also in terms of the budget you know we said we're not gonna we're not gonna uh buy something where we don't already have the money for it we're not gonna borrow any money so it totally paid for it and that's my wife and that's that's the integrity right of living not having more making believe i have more than i have and not having yeah. to, not having extra borrow and so that's all reduces the anxiety and also you feel good about the integrity you're living true to yourself you're not, you're putting a false image out to the world. Like ego is having a false image of who, <laughs> that's not that based on what the reality actually is. Right. So, and that's, so that's, that's doing a lot of work with your parts. Right. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah. because there's a part that says I have to have this money look this certain way. Right. So exactly. being true, true to yes. yourself and your system and who you right. really are. Yeah. Right. Cause one, one could say that one of the, I mean, I may, one I think could make a pretty good argument or point that you know the suffering in the world is is mostly because of people's need, think they need to do these status maneuvers mm. and then we leave our we, we come in and out of, we, we leave our own integrity we're not being true to us mm. i'll buy a bigger house than i can afford because mm. of status or and I know, of course that's probably to compensate for parts that are wounded and stuff exactly worthy, so. yeah so um but so what i'm trying to do is to be wary of parts of me that f feel like they do the status maneuvers and also know like oh what's underneath those parts that they're trying to help out and that i was like no i got those parts let me take care of them if they're still in any self-doubt and but you know and, and even if i haven't worked on that part or if it's if it got re-injured i'm not gonna make any major decision that's that lacks integrity that lacks confidence with my own truth so i'll stall you know Oh, I like and that. And then I'll do the inner work. So I won't make any major decisions unless I'm clear, unless I have less self has had the chance to come 
present and work with whatever parts that want me to make an impulsive decision. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I'll stall. <laughs> stall is a good thing. Stall, yeah. A self-compassionate stall. I like it. David, this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.